Warning, please watch until the end of the video. If you're jumping into the comments section to yell at me without watching until the end, you're missing the point. Hello everyone, my name is Spooky Dude, and today I'm going to be solving Deltarune. Okay, okay, I know that sounds like an exaggeration. However, I really think I can call this video Solving Deltarune, seeing how wide-reaching this theory really is. It goes way beyond simple concepts. I'm going to be mapping out what I think could genuinely happen in the future of Deltarune. I started working on a different video that ultimately led to this one. I was working on a video about how the Deltarune community overanalyzes everything. Text boxes and things that characters say that slightly conflict with each other are used as hard evidence. Characters who act in a very video game-ish way are suddenly super top secret twists, and minor plot holes are huge meaningful teases Toby is hiding right from under our noses. That kind of attitude is one that I vehemently disagree with, and I was making a video talking about all that. However, when I started, I realized something. I want to have a go at this. One try at making that insane, overly analytical theory that seems impossible. Based on all these random facts and puzzle pieces. So without further ado, my name is Spooky Dude. Follow me on Twitter. Please, I really need more Twitter followers. If we get to over a thousand, maybe I'll, uh, I'll do something cool. I don't know. And let's get started. It's time to solve Gaster. I find it very hard to think about the full future of Deltarune. When theorizing, I haven't seen anyone paint a convincing portrait of what the final game will look like, specifically post Chapter 4. That's because Deltarune hasn't really told us where it's going yet. We've got little inklings here and there, Gaster exists somewhere, your choices don't matter, Des is missing, Chris is possessed by us, the Dark Worlds are fiction and the Light World is reality, there's one ending, Chris knows some things that we don't, the Roaring will swallow the universe whole and we'll have to face the Titans and banish the Angels Heaven. <sighs> Analyzing all of these and trying to pick out how they all flow into one narrative experience, or alternatively, trying to figure out which one of these main points will be the focus of Deltarune, is nearly impossible. In order to attempt to string this theory along, to figure out where Deltarune is going, I say we analyze the only thing the creator has explicitly said about its endings. There's one. Only one ending, that's it? We've already seen that we're able to spare or fight in any given situation, and it does change the narrative, albeit slightly. I guess I could accept that regardless of who we spare or we fight, the one ending is inevitable. Okay, I, I guess that makes sense. But this whole one ending thing stops making sense once we start to look at Deltarune's alternate route, the Weird Route. The Weird Route is performed by manipulating Noelle into gaining enough power to use a spell called Snowgrave and kill Birdly. Alongside this newfound power comes a massive shift in narrative, with the Weird Route straying far from the events of the Pacifist Route. Not only do we kill Birdly, and he stays dead, but Spanton takes over the Queen's castle and Noelle, who is suddenly much more brave, has a terrifying moment of realization at the hospital. At this point, the story is different. Arcs are different. Characters are going in different ways, which begs the question. Is there really one ending? So first, here's the very easy cop-out answer. Then I'll get to the more complicated one. Toby always said there was one ending, except once. Supposedly, since I've had at-length discussions about this but suddenly can't find any hard evidence, in the Steam page of Deltarune, the description reads, And only one ending? You may think this is him being cheeky, except for the fact that, you know, again, supposedly, this text changed when Chapter 2 came out. Originally, it just read, And only one ending. That question mark was added after the Weird Route's inclusion. Again, this is something I'm 90% sure of, but not entirely certain. However, the fact that there's a question mark still applies. The very easy theory to make is Toby said there was one ending because he didn't want people thinking the endings were genocide or pacifist again. And what that means is, you know, he only started teasing that there could be more than one once the weird route is in because if he didn't, then, you know, you can't, like, tell the internet there's two endings, have two clear play styles, and expect them not to think these are the two endings. But again, this feels like a cop-out answer to me. If you look at all the times he's spoken about it, it really feels like he means that there's one ending. He specifically mentions that the battle system may be a bit redundant, seeing as that there's only one ending. So then we have to ask ourselves, with the inclusion of a second, vastly different route, how could there be only one ending? This brings me to the theory. The one ending theory. The ultimate solving gaster theory. The theory I call, Angel's Hell. Let's start from the very beginning. Who is Gaster? Seems to me like Gaster is super important, and yet we have barely seen anything about him in Deltarune so far. 
He's obviously given some build-up in Undertale, and we know he's been hinted at throughout Deltarune, so it's not insane to suggest that Gaster will end up being a very important character. The problem is, there are so many plot points that Deltarune is going through, and even a prophecy that pretty much outlines the rest of the game. So how does Gaster fit in, as someone that's supposedly super important? First off, this theory requires you to make one single assumption, and that assumption is that the guy who announced Deltarune on Twitter, and the Goner Maker guy, are both Gaster, as well as the guy on the file select screen. Besides that one mostly agreed upon assumption, the rest of this theory is based on facts we've been told or that have been hinted at in game. I'd like you to take a step back. Let's forget assumptions, let's forget feelings, let's analyze some facts that have already been told to us. 1. Toby Fox's very first tweet is The Edge of the Shadow, where reality and dream meet. This seems to be a reference to what would become World's Edge. 2. The very first official Deltarune teaser was in 2016, when the Deltarune.com website was updated to say, three heroes appeared and banished the angels' heaven, in wingdings. 3. Gaster claims, in the Twitter posts, that he has been waiting for a long time. 4. If you consider Deltarune's deeper story, that of the player's interaction with the larger world, as proof that our influence is diegetic, or something that happens in-universe, then the file select must be diegetic as well. When we're on the file select, that's canon. Not only that, but Gaster is currently existent on the file select. I see this throwing up some red flags to a lot of people because that implies a lot of things. However, in-game, there is a character who speaks to us on the file select, and if you consider us being diegetic characters, this is canon. 5. Gaster is in control of the files, not us. He asks us which file we want changed, and does it for us. The language he uses clearly demonstrates that he's the one controlling the saves. 6. Spamton wanted to reach heaven. However, the Darkeners all know of the Light World, so why did Spamton go insane trying to reach heaven? Perhaps there's a place beyond the Light World that Spamton was clued in on? This ties into Jevil, who also knows of something beyond the Light World, as he says that even we aren't free. 7. Gaster knew we'd be involved with Chris, Susie, and Noel. While the whole second speaker thing is widely debated, and, you know, I can get into that, god, uh, regardless of your personal view, it's clear he intended for us to go on this very specific journey. 8. Gaster is able to influence the Deltarune world, however so far that is only true for the Dark Worlds, and the Depths, which is the fan-made name for the area Gaster is in. It does have some canon ground, seeing that the image of it is called IMG underscore Depths, so I'll continue to call the place Gaster's in the Depths. 9. Gaster's goal is to create a new future with us, and he claims things are going well so far. So what does this all mean? Based on these facts, I think we can say for sure that Gaster's plan involves us seeing that the prophecy is completed. This isn't the most shocking suggestion, however, the very end of the prophecy being in Wingdings, Gaster saying everything is going well, it makes sense to me that Gaster knows of the prophecy and expects us to see it through. But why? Many people claim that Gaster cares about the Deltarune world and its inhabitants, or that he's a good guy who's actually doing this to save the world. But let's go back to those facts I pointed out. Remember what I said about the files? He's 100% willing to delete any save file we ask. Why? Why would Gaster, who's supposedly super nice and cares about the world, be willing to delete our progress? Not only that, but why would he care about a world that he knows has a probably near infinite number of copies? Why would he care about a world where we can actively travel back in time to change things? What do people think? That we'll save the world and he'll go, thank you, that was totally awesome, and then just leave? What's his endgame? And that's where I'd like to remind you of one thing, the prophecy. See, there's this huge misinterpretation I see all the time when it comes to the prophecy. So many players seem to think that Deltarune's ending will be the Titans destroying the world, that we'll be unable to defeat them. Which is really odd, considering that Deltarune has literally told us what the supposed ending will be. The Roaring and the Legend are part of one prophecy. The sky running black with terror part is clearly the Roaring, as shown pretty explicitly in the Roaring Explanation cutscene. So if the Titans aren't the ending of Deltarune, what is? The Banishing of Angel's Heaven. The very, very end. The last event we currently know will happen is three heroes appear at World's Edge and banish the Angel's Heaven. The legend claims this will restore balance and save the world from destruction. So is that it? 
the world is saved via a generic fantasy MacGuffin uh, saving the world plot? What is Angel's Heaven, and what does it mean to banish it? And it was that question that allowed me to piece together my largest theory yet. Let's take into account everything we know. Gaster falling into his own creation in Undertale, Spamton and Jevil knowing there's something beyond the light world, and again, I know that some people will disagree with that, people still disagree with me on Discord over that, that's not a necessary piece of this puzzle, but, you know, take it or leave it, doesn't matter. Gaster's ability to influence the Dark Worlds, him waiting for us for a long time, and suddenly some things start to get pieced together. He knows about the prophecy. His goal is specifically for us to banish the Angel's Heaven. And yet, that banishing takes place in a universe that has multiple variants, a world that he is fully willing to delete on command. How could Gaster himself be inserted into this story? How could Gaster play a role in this ultimate conclusion? Why would banishing the Angel's Heaven somehow benefit him? And that's when I f started figuring things out. Allow me now to run through the ending of Deltarune Chapter 7, or at least a rough draft version of what I think it will be, after which I'll explain to you why this is. We've beaten the Titans. All is good. Ralse, Susie, and Chris all make their way towards World's Edge. The world is on the brink of destruction. The roaring has torn through the light world. Ralse, on the way there, is asked by Susie, What's the deal with this world's edge anyway? Are you sure that banishing this so-called heaven is going to save the world? Ralse admits that he himself is unsure. He's known a lot. He's knowledgeable about the way the dark world works, but as he himself is beginning to turn to stone, he admits he isn't sure of the future. As we finally arrive, Ralse actually says the prophecy was something that was told to him by a nice man he met. He says that that man was very nice and helped guide him towards the beginning of this journey in the first place. He wonders how that man himself knew so much about the future. We arrive at World's Edge. It's not literally the edge of the world, it's more of a metaphorical edge. This is the edge of reality. The separation between light and dark. The separation between fiction and reality. And we are now responsible for banishing the angel's heaven. We begin the process. Whether that's all putting our hands up, raising our swords, I don't know. However, with our hearts united as one, we begin to banish the Angel's Heaven. A man stands at the edge of reality. He has finally exited from the Angel's Heaven. He stands in front of us. Thank you, he says. I have been waiting so long for this moment. I apologize that I could not share the full details of your mission. Regardless, you have been a tremendous asset. I suppose I owe you some form of explanation. I am Dr. W.D. Gaster though I have a feeling you already know that. I'm aware of your devotion to this world. I've been shown that you care for the people you've met, the wonderful friends you have made. And because of that, I'm sorry that you won't get to see this story through to its end. I have waited for a world like this for so, so long to finally be able to step into a better reality, a better world. A world where I will have the control I've longed for. I must thank you for the opportunity, however... I'm afraid that I no longer need your assistance. Your existence in this world threatens the both of us. You will be permanently ejected. Goodbye. And the game resets back to the title screen just like that. Deltarune has ended. Upon returning to the chapter select and clicking chapter 7, a terrifying realization will be made. Your file is no longer yours to change. You can't enter it, you can't delete it, you can't copy it. The name on the file now reads the one single name that no other file can bear. Gaster. Thus, Deltarune ends? Holy cow, that's a bit much, don't you think? <laughs> now, I, I can already see the angry Deltarune fans who were so sure that the ending was going to be everyone happy and smiling and holding hands, getting ready to kill me in the comments, and first off, that's not the actual ending. Wait for me to finish. And second, again, I want to repeat that this is the product of lining up facts the game has told us and treating them all like they're puzzle pieces that must fit in with the other puzzle pieces. Like I already said, watch until the end. This is actually me from the future. Uh, I am editing this video and I realize I ramble on a lot about puzzle pieces fitting together. What I mean is that the Deltarune community is treating it like the facts we have now are all the puzzle pieces we need. Like we've been given a puzzle that has, you know, 
270 pieces instead of the 1,000 piece puzzle it really will be. What I mean is that when I say like, oh, this is, you know, treating everything like a puzzle piece that has to fit in, what I mean is that we don't have the full puzzle. We don't have to uh, put all these pieces together. There are going to be chunks of the puzzle that fit and chunks that don't fit in with any of the rest. All I mean is whenever you hear me talking about this whole, you know, oh, the puzzle pieces, everything's a puzzle piece logic, it's just me pretty much saying I don't like how the community is treating it like we have enough evidence to solve the whole game uh, and, you know, every single thing has to connect with every single other thing. So what was that all about? Well, to put it simply, I believe banishing the angel's heaven is a fancy way of saying freeing the devil from his prison. You can't banish a place, which is why I think that the fact that we're banishing the angel's heaven shows that we're taking someone out of somewhere. Like if I said, I'm banishing the dishes prison instead of I'm taking the dishes out of the dishwasher. Gaster's so far has been on our level with a near equal level of control. However, he has been unable to affect the light world, as that's literally the reality he has been attempting to step into. Therefore, like the chess-playing puppet master so many fans think he is, he set up a fictional tale, a prophecy that he's had for many years, that has guided Chris, us, Susie, and Ralsei to a singular spot, in which a hole in reality can be made. The depths, the source of this world's darkness, contains Gaster. We've seen Gaster's influence inside the Dark Worlds, and so it's no surprise that Gaster's whole darkness motif could lead to him being trapped in the source of all darkness. After all, that seems to be what he discovered in Undertale. At this point, the only way for him to step into reality is to rip open a hole in the barrier that separates him from the real world. And that can only be done during the Roaring, in which both worlds become one, and the heroes and a real-world player with the same amount of power as him all can go to the edge of reality. This whole time, Gaster has been playing us. The reason he doesn't care about the three files, about deleting progress, is all because his one singular care has been the end point, the conclusion of the journey. He needs us to go to World's Edge. That's what Spamton and Jevil know about. They know about us, about Gaster, about the depths, that there's something that's real beyond the light world. That's why three heroes appeared at World's Edge was the first Deltarune teaser in Wingdings. Now, there is one big fat elephant in the room question that gets asked here, and that's where things get a bit messy. Okay, have you ever seen those videos where they're making bread, and they roll some dough, and then they cut it off and put it to the side, like, okay, here's my nice, smooth, perfect bread dough, and here's a whole bunch of other shit I now have to work with. That's this point in the video. I've cut the bread. The very basic, very clean version of this theory is Gaster has been leading us to the edge of reality where we'll let him into the world during the roaring and he'll be the final antagonist. Does he take control of the file like I suggested? That's up for personal interpretation. The very basic Gaster calls the depths angels heaven and will summon him from there is the basic outline of this theory because here's where it starts to get messy. Still facts, but we're going to be getting into a bit more facts and basic assumptions territory. So, that big elephant in the room question. If banishing the angel's heaven is summoning Gaster from his prison, does that make Gaster the angel? And I personally think that's the biggest, most annoying question to answer. See, Undertale did this nice and cleanly. There were two angels, Azriel and Kara. They both returned from the surface and the underground went empty. The angel was based on whatever route you did. Nice and easy, made sense. The problem with Deltarune is that the angel can be one of a million goddamn things. Are you talking about the in-universe deity that the hometown worships known as the angel? Or the metaphorical angel the game seems to be hinting at with Noel or Des? Or the angel connection that is made in the dark world where it is hinted at the player being the angel? Or the angel from the prophecy whose heaven we have to banish? And to be honest with you, this muddies everything. Focusing just on the angel of the prophecy for one second, yes, this theory thinks that Gaster is the angel. That angel specifically, the fictional prophecy angel. Considering this theory states that Gaster created the prophecy himself, calling himself the angel and describing the depths as his heaven is the equivalent of someone in this world gaining a lot of power and calling themselves God. Are they actually God? The God who this whole world worships? No. However, due to their powers being somewhat similar, they call themselves God. That's the relation I'm suggesting here. Gaster calls himself the angel in the prophecy. But wait, spooky dude, isn't Gaster associated with demons? After all, his number is always sixes and six six sixes. Yeah, and if anything, that just boosts my point by 100%. 
see, this wouldn't be the first time a demon has been referred to by the name Angel. It happened in Undertale. Kara is a demon literally and yet fulfills the role of the angel on genocide. This theory believes that banishing the angel's heaven is a trick and a twisted way of us helping Gaster out of his prison. How did Gaster end up there? He fell. What's the story of Lucifer, Satan himself? Well, Lucifer was angry that God had all the power. He wasn't happy with there being some greater influence over him, and so he decided to usurp that power. He wanted to literally be God. However, after that didn't work, Lucifer was banished from heaven in what is called Satan's fall from heaven. I'm not saying that this story of Gaster is a literal Satan parallel, but someone falling into hell after attempting to usurp the power to control the world, who was associated with sixes and devil symbolism, clearly means something. There's also a lot of indication in-game that the deaths may be connected to hell, as, as, also, as well as uh, Angel's Heaven. First off, the depths. The depths of hell. Not like any explicit connection there, but, I mean, people talk about the depths of hell. What song plays when we're at the Dark Fountains? The HOLY, in all caps. Considering the Dark Fountains seem to be springing from the depths, that certainly says something. And wait a minute, well, the HOLY, again in all caps, is the Dark Fountains theme, what does Jevil say about the depths? Hell's roar bubbles from the depths. The depths are compared to hell, with the only time they've been implied to be holy in all caps, implying that perhaps while the song probably isn't, like the song title isn't diegetic, it's playing into that this quest you think is a holy one is actually quite sinister vibe. Gaster is the fictitious angel of the prophecy. Gaster's the one who fell into the depths. The angel's heaven isn't really heaven, it's hell. Gaster isn't the angel, he's the devil. After all, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. There's a lot about this theory I really like. The game refusing to allow us to name a file Gaster actually being Gaster himself who's doing that, only for the grand payoff to be Gaster taking over our file, I would have chills. The game's big twist being that this entire adventure has been carefully planned by Gaster himself, We've just been tricked into believing he has good intentions, the implications this could set up in terms of the greater narrative. Well, it sounds very fan fiction-y, someone escaping from their reality by becoming the god of a fictional universe should sound very, very familiar to you. Overall, I think this theory has wings, no pun intended. However, that doesn't mean Gaster is necessarily the only angel that comes into play. More on that later. For now, let's look at what this theory would imply for the actual ending of the game. These titles are getting more and more accusatory. Okay, okay, yeah. Besides the whole angel thing, which I actually haven't finished talking about, the second biggest elephant in the room is how mind-bogglingly terrible of an ending that'd be. Springing an otherworldly deity onto a casual 12-year-old player who doesn't know what the hell is going on doesn't classify as top-tier writing. And not only that, but this is an incredibly unsatisfying conclusion to the story of Chris and Friends. How do you explain this, spooky dude? Okay, well, remember that whole bread-making analogy where I said, here's the nice clean stuff, here's all the other stuff I have to work with, where I cut the bread in a nice smooth place to make everything look nice and tidy? Okay, well, I'm cutting the bread again, and now we're at a layer with even more uncertainty and assumptions. Again, at this point, this very basic theory could be correct still, but let's keep going. So the biggest problem with this ending for me is that this ending discludes talking about the two biggest plot lines, or uh, what I think will end up being the two biggest plot lines. Chris's possession and Des. This also brings another question along, but wait, Toby said there'd be one ending, and this whole ending requires the entire game to be diegetic, meaning if Gaster is localized in one file, couldn't you just play another file to completion without Gaster interfering? And what about the weird route? At this point, I'm sweating buckets like a single chef working the rush hour at a five-star restaurant that Gordon Ramsay is currently reviewing because juggling all this nonsense is nearly impossible. Unless you're willing to upset the fanbase. A lot. See, there's one more piece to this theory that, like I said, you can disregard if you just like the base theory more. However, when asking how Chris's possession, Des, and the weird route come into play, this is the only way I can see it happening. See, Gaster isn't the only person in the depths. Someone else is there as well. Someone silently influencing the Dark Worlds. Someone whose disappearance is very similar to that of Dr. Gaster himself. Someone whose name keeps popping up, whose presence is felt so strongly, despite never actually being seen. And that person is December Holiday. 
The baseball moon and December name spelling in chapter 2, her potentially calling us through the voice of Spanton, it seems like Dest may be in a similar situation to Gaster. Whether or not she knows this, we're not too sure yet. Let's go back to that in-game scenario I told you. Remember when I walked you through what I thought the ending might be like? Let's think about that again. What does one do when they're locked out of their save file? Where else do you go? Perhaps you start a new file in Chapter 7. Remember, like I said before, everything is diegetic, right? So if Gaster is locked into your save file, let's just go start another Chapter 7 file. Except when the heroes approach World's Edge, there's just... nothing. No Link, the Angel's Heaven, the Deaths, no, nothing. No way to stop the Roaring. Unfortunately, Gaster's plan required darkness from the Deaths to flood the world, and the unfortunate problem with this is that it pretty much dooms all reality, when he himself isn't involved. This means there's no logical way to beat him by simply finishing the game on another file. But hey, all hope isn't lost. This is where, again, like before, like my uh, discussion about how there could possibly be one or two endings, this is where another fork in the road comes in. There are kind of two different paths you could follow to see how the game plays out. The logical conclusion at this point, spoiler alert, sorry, is that our goal once Gaster is brought into his own file is literally to find her. The only person who can contest Gaster is Des, the other character with heavy angel symbolism. Des is in the depths as well, however finding her will take some sort of psychic otherworldly power we don't have, but someone else might. Now again, why do I say fork in the road? Because there's two logical ways to go about doing this. One logical conclusion is that at this point, similar to how Noelle entered a maze with no exit in her blog, players will have to embark on a hunt for some way to beat Gaster. That includes doing all the little side content in each chapter, maybe doing a twisted sword playthrough, etc. This option is interesting, and I would like to do a future video on the potential of Deltarune doing a crazy, winding, puzzle box-like experience. But there's not much to say here. The remainder of this video will focus on option two. You know, the one that I said will make everyone in the community mad. But before that, let's go through a brief intermission, focused on a separate, but ultimately related, point. Intermission. The weird route should be mandatory. I narrated that one, didn't you like that? I know, I know, please don't take your pick for, pick, pitchforks out yet! Please let me explain. This is a point I'd like to discuss separate from the massive theory I've just laid out. I understand how incredibly terrible that sounds to a lot of people. Just let me give you my thoughts. This is something I subscribe to separate from the Angel's Hell theory. First off, the third elephant in the room. Didn't Toby say there'd be one ending? And that, again, is a super annoying question, because it's a whole other can of worms. I'm eventually making a longer video about the ending of Deltarune and the inclusion of the Weird Route, but here's my very basic statement on how I think the ending will go. I don't think it'll be something as simple as the neutral ending of Undertale. Even if one single line of events happen, and happens every time, characters have gone through different arcs, different paths, meaning it's not the same ending. I always use this stupid example, but just hear me out. Jingle All the Way, a Christmas movie about Arnold looking for a Turbo Man action figure for his son Jamie at the last minute. See, it's Christmas time and Arnold didn't actually get the figure for him. Out of panic, he is now running around on Christmas Eve looking for a Turbo Man action figure. The movie comments on things like consumerism and, you know, the wide, uh, widespread advertisement of Christmas and how it's just a giant consumerist holiday these days, but it's ultimately about Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to become a better father for his son Jamie. He never actually gets the action figure, however, the movie's big ultimate message is about how Arnold's commitment as a father and how he's dropped the ball have caused him to split from Jamie. He never gets the figure, but during that wild hunt, he's still neglecting his son, even on Christmas Eve. At the very last minute, he decides, oh damn, I'm kind of a sucky father, and goes to spend time with Jamie. Only after he's made this decision does he end up in a series of mishaps that land him not only the Turbo Man figure, but a perfect position to cover up everything he previously did. The movie ends with Jamie giving that figure to another person, proudly saying he has the real Turbo Man at home. Where in God's name am I going with this? Okay, imagine this scenario. The movie is the exact same. The ending 20 minutes are exactly the same, but 
Halfway through the movie, instead of getting humiliated time and time again in a series of silly mishaps, Arnold, pressured by the over-commercialization and competitive attitude during Christmas time, snaps, becoming a killer who murders people looking for the Turbo Man figure. This goes on until that exact moment when he realizes, oh shit, I'm a sucky dad. The ending is the exact same, but is it really? Would you say these two versions of this movie ended the same? Because chances are, when describing the end of any movie, you don't literally recite the last 10 minutes, you recap the arc the characters went on. When asked how Star Wars ends, you don't say, oh yeah, Luke Skywalker blows up the Death Star. You say, Luke Skywalker learns to use the Force, watches Obi-Wan die, and goes on a suicide mission to blow up the Death Star, and he embraces his Force abilities to let him blow it up, finally becoming the hero he always was. That's how Star Wars ends. A character's journey is always factored in when discussing the ending. In Monsters University, you don't say Mike Wazowski and Sully save the day but get kicked out of school. That's not the ending. It's Mike Wazowski learns that just because something is your dream doesn't mean it can always come true. However, what's most important is making the best of what you have. And that's kind of, and I, I, that's a shortened down version of the message, but that's the message and that's something that happened over the course of the entire movie. Everybody has talents, you know, everybody is unique and we have to play off of those. It's... That's something that has happened throughout the entire movie, not just the last 10 minutes. Two different stories can't have the same ending. So, with that being said, I do not think the weird route and the main route will end in the same way. Even if it's the exact same, Birdly is dead, Noel is possessed, that's a different ending. Even if the Titans destroyed the entire world and everybody loses and it's exactly what fans think, Noel is possessed and messed up, Birdly's dead different ending. The only logical explanation I can think of is either A, it's all a time loop, or it ends with the player quits, or something stupidly meta like that, or B, both routes will converge into one story, revealing the game's true one ending. So now we've established in the most roundabout way possible why I think Deltarune will have one ending involving two different routes. But why? Why would I want the weird route to be canon? Why do I feel it needs to be? Well, here's the thing. The genocide route in Undertale has a point. Recently, there's been arguing about how the genocide route sucks because it's boring and how it yells at you for playing the game as intended. And that's exactly the thing. It's not. The game doesn't want you to kill. It doesn't want you to play in a boring manner. It's criticizing and highlighting a portion of gamers who ruin games for the sake of punishing themselves. The kind of people who tell you that you're not allowed to use magic in Elden Ring because it makes the game too easy. That's stupid and total bullshit. The genocide route is also effective because your save file gets corrupted permanently. I would not give a single damn if the genocide route was on a separate file. As a matter of fact, that would actively ruin its biggest point. When playing genocide, you're ruining the happiness and future of the monsters. Whether you delete your pacifist save or simply play from scratch, they'll never know the surface. What it means to live freely, and that's because of you. Even once you complete genocide route, you'll never get that true happy ending. If the genocide route was on a second file, the story of you overwriting a good ending just to appease your curiosity is no longer there. It wouldn't matter, and then I'd say, yeah, this is yelling at you for playing as intended. For the genocide route to be effective, it must be diegetic. And in Deltarune, the weird route already is. After all, the files, as I explained, seem to be diegetic, so us having a pacifist file and a weird route file are also diegetic. If the weird route is simply a darker version of pacifist, in which Noel is manipulated and mentally broken, in which everything is quicker and more depressing, except it loses the meta storytelling elements in which there's zero real cons of playing it, what's the point? Why put it in the game? Seems like a forced insertion of a genocide-like route to appease the fans. I mean, I've seen people even suggesting that the Snowgrave route is there to show us that our choices really don't matter, that whatever ending pacifist is, Snowgrave will have the same one, and you'll be told, well, you did some messed up stuff this time, but it still didn't help you. That's such like a slap in the face, that's not even a real ending, there's no narrative value to that. Unless... Unless that the Snowgrave route has some benefit to doing it. I mean, look at it from the diegetic angle again. The genocide route's entire point was you're going to play this just because you need to see everything. The playing of this route is the point, whereas Snowgrave doesn't have that. It's most likely not going to be that same message again. Not only that, but there's already been a hint as to why we're doing Snowgrave, and what potential benefit it has. 
In Spamton's Snowgrave fight, he says, You think making frozen chicken with your side chick is gonna let you drink up all that sweet, sweet freedom sauce? Well, you're bleep right. But don't blame me when you're crying in a broken home wishing you let your old pal Spamton kill you. Obviously, this is confusing and worded in a very spamton -y way. However, the message seems really clear. <laughs> There's a benefit, some benefit, or at least an implied benefit to the Snowgrave route. Let me do my best to translate here. He's pretty much saying, do you think teaching Noelle Snowgrave, or alternatively, do you think doing Snowgrave, or just some way to discuss Noelle freezing everyone, is going to give you some form of freedom? Well, it will, but don't come crying to me when everything is terrible, wishing I had killed you. Spamton is saying we'll get whatever it is we want out of Snowgrave, however, there will be some drawback. And that's the thing, the Snowgrave route is really interesting. For getting the dark themes and edginess, it provides the most interesting look at the Chris's possession arc we've seen. I said it before, I wouldn't mind if Ralsei ends up being some Asriel centric manifestation. Because yeah, that would be weird! The scenes between Ralsei and Chris that have romantic undertones would be messed up, and that'd provide some interesting amount of commentary on the relationship between the player and Chris, and by extension, us and fiction. Something that always bothered me is how people treat fictional characters in terms of romance. And while I partially touch it on my shipping video, which isn't nearly as negative as the thumbnail looks, give it a watch if you haven't, lots of characters end up getting philanderized or have portions of their character entirely removed due to people wanting to ship them. There are certain Undertale couples that everyone ships that are really, really weird, and characters in said ship have canon elements about them that are completely ignored. That's literally what's going on with Ralsei and Chris, if Ralsei does end up being, you know, Asriel style centric character. The weird route features this in its strongest amount though. We're seeing Noelle push to her limits to become stronger. We're seeing Chris as a character watch their childhood friend get messed up by them, and they have zero control over it. We're seeing real people get killed due to the actions of Chris that they can't stop. This is all bad, don't get me wrong, but I feel that for the whole player versus Chris storyline, this route features the heaviest argument for us not to be here. And that's the thing, if the game tells us after we beat Pacifist, we should leave Chris alone, and that we were bad for taking over their body and acting for them, I feel like that's a huge case of how dare you play the game as intended. Obviously, you know, if it was a real world thing and you took over someone's body, that's wrong. But this is a video game in which that twist, the whole player is possessing Chris, isn't even something I realized until the end of chapter 2. I feel like we really need some major argument for the player is bad for being here. Just some more drama, some more conflict. Maybe this is it? Maybe for the greater good or for some beneficial reason, we're pressured into doing the weird route, and in doing so, we have good intentions, but we still perform the messed up actions? I feel that there's going to have to be some more context as to why we'd even aim to do the weird route. With that being said, I think you can see where I'm going with this and how it connects back to Angel's Hell. <laughs> So with Gaster having completely taken over our file and the world of Deltarune left seemingly in danger, what do we have to do to fight back? Well, as I said before, there's someone else in the depths. Someone who could perhaps face off against Gaster, or at least give us the strength to do it ourselves, December Holiday. And as we've seen in Noelle's blog posts, there's already kind of been a character who may have the psychological ability to bring her back. To find her. And that's Noelle. But how can we draw that out of her? How can we, as the player, use Noelle as a pawn to extract the, uh, as much psychic sister-saving energy as possible? Well, you know, think first of all, think about the blog post where she used, she focused hard enough and found a locked door. It implies that Noelle is able to use those abilities. If we really consider this is how the game would continue, then in order to get those abilities out of her, in order to give her that psychic sister-saving energy, we'd, yeah, we'd probably have to make her stronger. I'd like to reiterate, please watch till the end, I know at this point it's going insane, but I have a point to make. Anyway, so what do we do in order to save Des? We have to use the power of Noelle. Perhaps that's where the weird route is going. Maybe that's why Spamton says we'll find freedom, because we are literally locked out of our save file. Perhaps that the events of the weird route will stray further and further from the main route. Maybe Noelle tapping into cold, hard memories, fully unlocking her strongest abilities, and pushing her psyche in such a specific way, will, in the same way she found that strange door in the maze she played, lead to her finding Des. Perhaps by the end of the route, we'll be in a different scenario, in which we'll have to extract Des from the Angel's Heaven rather than Gaster, where we save Des from the depths and use her as a help to fight Gaster once and for all. With Des by our side, she can allow us to fight Gaster. Now, this is another fork in the road. How the hell are we going to fight Gaster? 
Again, the everything is diegetic nature of this theory leads to confusing questions. My theory is that Des, with her power of similar to Gasterness, is able to open up that original file, bringing us back in and allowing us to fight him. This raises a number of questions like, which team fights Gaster? Will there be two versions of each character? Weird Chris and regular Chris? That's a whole other thing I'm not too sure of. I think that again, following this specific line of events, there'd have to be some interesting send-off to the weird route. The version of this theory I like is that we'd use our weird route team to battle Gaster. In doing so, we'd have OP Noel and OP Chris battle Gaster with Des on our side, providing super-powered support. Then perhaps Des has some sad goodbye send-off to Weird Noel, with us and Weird Chris kind of awkwardly saying goodbye, with Chris having the option to, I don't know, maybe say some words to us? I don't know. Regardless, at the end, I imagine we'd have to delete the Weird Route file, something that Chris themselves may ask us to do, something that the game probably wouldn't track, just kind of a personal choice we'd have to make. Following this, our big Gaster throwdown would be complete. Gaster took over our file, and then using the Weird team, we beat him forever. The pacifist gang has no clue what just went down. They believe Ralsei's prophecy to have worked. They banished the angel's heaven, things went dark, and then the world was saved from destruction. We know better, though. This ending feels very, I don't know, homestucky? Multiple characters' variants meeting their dead siblings and having some form of forgiveness or moving on from the past, only for a reality-ending event in which a lord of multiple realities is killed? Very homestucky. So I guess that's that. To recap, the prophecy is leading us to World's Edge, which is literally the barrier between our world and the Depths, and by banishing it, we're actually bringing Gaster into our world. After doing so, he locks us out of our file, and we'll have to find some way to beat him. To do this, we'll have to play through the Weird Route, summoning Des from the same place with her acting as our ally with a similar power level to Gaster. Then we fight Gaster with our Weird Route OP team and save the world on one file, leading us to a satisfying end of the story. But if you check the runtime of this video, something's obviously up. It's not over. A truck is driving past my house. What the? Come on. And that's the thing. First off, allow me to explain the graphic. This is essentially splitting the theory into sections and showing how likely each section is to be happening. The first part, the Gaster is in the depths and is leading us to retrieve him part, is really believable. But the end? That's kind of nuts. So do with this what you will. But before I continue, I'd like to do something most theorists don't do. For the rest of this video, I'm going to poke holes in this theory. Part 6, Debunking Angel's Hell Theory So the sheer amount of insane things that would have to happen for this theory to work out, am I right? Here's the thing, you may remember in the beginning of this video, I stated the purpose of this theory was er, to make one big crazy theory due to me, you know, wanting to make a video about how most giant puzzle PC theories are fundamentally flawed. And that's true. But as I said, most giant puzzle PC theories are fundamentally flawed. Let's ask why. This video did not start as a video attempting to solve Deltarune. It actually began as a small scale video debunking a tiny rules card theory that I've seen floating around. See, there's this theory. In the pacifist route, Ralsei explains to us that some Darkeners may not belong in other Dark Worlds, and therefore will turn to stone. We see Lancer turn to stone, and then later fight Rules Card, who eventually turns to stone himself. The fanbase, confused as to why it took Rules so much longer to turn to stone, began crafting a theory. See, Rules is wearing a pirate hat, and attempting to use a pirate accent. Many claim that since Rules is acting as a pirate, he doesn't turn to stone, as it fits in the Dark World's theming. You know, like an internet pirate. The theory states that he only turns to stone once he drops the pirate act. This theory isn't insane, it just suggests that Darkeners can fit in with other Dark Worlds via their attitudes. It answers the simple question of, why did Rules turn to stone later than Lancer? And it bothers me to an absolutely insane level. First off, let's easily debunk it. Rules turns to stone sooner on the weird route. When we arrive at Queen's Overthrown Castle, Rules is already stone, even though he's still wearing the pirate hat. When bringing this up, the people who really like this theory suggest really wide-reaching things like, well, maybe the weird route affects the fountains and its will. No. You want the answer? Why did Rules turn to stone after Lancer? Because Toby Fox wanted us to fight Rules in a silly boss battle. And in order to end without us definitively beating him, seeing as it's implied Rules has more power than we think, Toby ends it by turning him to stone, a mechanic we've already been accustomed to because of Lancer. Why did he turn to stone sooner in the weird route? Because a silly rules card fight wouldn't fit the tone of the weird route. Not everything needs to be a puzzle piece that fits into other puzzle pieces, even if 
it doesn't have some explanation or seems to be some kind of a plot hole. This rules thing is just the beginning. There's a scene in The Simpsons where Homer is taking questions from fans of the in-universe television show Itchy and Scratchy. One fan asks, In episode 2F09, when Itchy plays Scratchy's skeleton like a xylophone, he strikes the same rib twice in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. I mean, what are we to believe? That this is some sort of, a uh, magic xylophone or something? Boy, I really hope someone got fired for that blunder. This quote is meant to make fun of the ultra-nerd culture and the hardcore fans who overanalyze everything. And honestly, it's totally correct. I feel that this generation of media's insistence on forming tightly wound universes collides with the deep lore side of recent indie games to create fans that will not accept the idea that not everything has a deeper meaning. Here's a whole bunch of things I have actually spoken to people about and they vehemently ex uh, insist mean something. The clocks in Hometown are all set to different times. This obviously means nothing, and in the case of the two classrooms, are probably due to the artist flipping the sprite when beginning to work on the next room. People have told me they are shocked, I don't think it means something. When Noelle is saved from the enemies in her room by Susie, Susie uses Rude Buster on them, yet they get pacified. What are we supposed to believe? This is some kind of magic Rude Buster? I hope someone got fired for that blunder. The school's layout and window placement doesn't make any sense. The reflections inside the school don't make any physical sense. Alphys sent Chris and Susie to look for chalk in the morning and didn't check on them all day? Asgore and Noel are described as regularly coming into Sans' store, and yet Sans just recently moved in. Chris searched up college summer vacation when. Why didn't they just ask Asriel? Furthermore, seeing that it's fall, is this proof that Asriel missed summer vacation? Fun fact, this is the largest evidence towards the Asriel is dead theory. Hooray! I've had long arguments with someone who claims that the light blue heart on Jockington's locker proves that Chris has the cyan soul, since why would Jockington have a blue heart on his locker unless he saw someone's light blue soul, leaving them to believe Chris ripped out their blue soul and showed Jockington because otherwise why would there be a blue soul on his locker? Because Jockington is blue and just because fun colors and red souls have explicit meaning? No, surely it must mean Chris ripped out their light blue soul. Don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing that these points are terrible plot holes that must be solved. I'm saying they're plot holes that shouldn't need to be solved. People constantly mistake cinematic shorthand and stylization for secret lore teases and plot holes. Recently I saw a few discussions on Twitter about how the sound effect didn't play when Chris puts their, back, their soul back in at the end of chapter 2, which might mean they didn't put us back in, when in reality I think that's highly debatable. These stupid plot holes aren't important. Toby isn't infallible. Things like college summer vacation when are clearly supposed to convey a feeling or message. Chris frequently searches for when their brother might return home. But no, surely that must mean something we don't understand. Surely this simple fact needs to be a puzzle piece that fits into all the other puzzle pieces. Chris Knight is a good theory, a theory that is not debunked. The one thing that people use to definitively debunk it is the fact that upon closing the Dark World, Noelle and Birdley are already started studying. People claim this means that the Dark World was open during their study session, which is kind of... insane? You're telling me that they didn't see it opening? They didn't see the night? Isn't it possible that, oh, I don't know, they were studying when the fountain closed because Toby needed a realistic way for Noelle to believe it was a dream? And if she woke up on the floor with stuff all over the place, that'd be really weird? But no, this must be a factual, in-universe puzzle piece that debunks a giant theory that has lots of ground. This kind of thinking, it bothers me a lot. Not only is there a lot of hints that the cyber world was opened a little while before Noelle and Birdley got there, but the theory that someone opened it in the tiny window in which Noelle and Birdley started studying and there wasn't a giant traffic jam is such a stretch. This line of thinking, this magic xylophone kind of theorizing, in which every plot hole and every tiny dialogue must mean something in relation to everything else, really drags down fan bases, in my opinion. Need an example of a fan base that thinks everything must mean everything and constantly pulls at little tiny things that don't mean anything? Okay, okay, this video is long enough. I'm not going to launch into an hour long rant about the Five Nights at Freddy's fan base. That's for another video. What I will say is that the fan base constantly questions things like, why was Springtrap's design changed prior to Five Nights at Freddy's 6? Is this some kind of massive lore tease? Is this not Springtrap? Well, the obvious answer is because merchandise. Stories can be written with well-made in-universe rules, only to go and completely break those rules without it meaning anything. 
Deadpool looks at the screen and breaks character in the Deadpool movie. Does this mean canonically we're part of the Deadpool world and he literally sees us and blah 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 blah? The Joker movie ends with a big sign that everything we just saw may not be exactly how it happened. And it ends on a note that wants you to question what was fiction and what was reality. Problem is, people still argue what was real and what was fake. What happened? This the proof that this scene is the real world. Proof that this... That's not the point. They're missing the point of the movie. It doesn't matter what happened canonically. What, what matters is the messages and themes and feelings the movie conveyed. I see this happening all the time with Deltarune. Not only that, but another problem I see with the Deltarune theories is that they are incredibly wide-reaching and attempt to answer everything without considering the possibility of new mechanics or world-building elements being added in that completely change our way of thinking. I compare a lot of these theories to Jenga. One piece of support gets taken out and the whole tower crumbles. It can be constructed with millions of pieces of evidence, but if a single support piece falls, the connection between these evidence pieces no longer matters. Take for example my statement that clearly Gaster is out for personal gain, since he knows this world has numerous files and exists outside of them all. All it would take is for Gaster to say, hey, I didn't know if I could trust you, but now that you've gotten this far, I'm letting you know that if you get a happy ending in one universe, I have a device that can allow that ending across the entire multiverse. Boom, theory destroyed. Or how about Gaster created the prophecy since the earliest version of the prophecy is in Wingdings? All it would take is, ah yes, the prophecy. When I first fell into this world, it was whispered to me in darkness, and boom, theory destroyed. Or how about something as simple as Ralsei saying, banishing the angels heaven is the process of sealing the final fountain, ending all darkness but restoring the light back to its original state, and boom, entire foundation of this theory is gone. There's also an, a lot of overall problems with this theory just in general, especially the full version and the thought about the weird route. This theory kind of kicks a lot of the stuff to the curb. Asgore's police firing, Noelle's personal relationship problems with Chris, Asriel entirely, etc. with the entire focus of the endgame being giant multiversal gaster battle. That feels so overly corny and like Undertale gaster fan comic that went on way too long. That doesn't feel like a satisfying ending to a game that's biggest, most interesting plot points are interpersonal character relationships. There's also the implication that the players who won't do the weird route will be stuck with their characters being tortured by Gaster for eternity. Not a fun concept! But I actually will switch sides again for one minute. One cool idea I had about the Roaring is that it's not like total wasteland and destruction like we think, but instead it's just an insane fantasy kingdom, like the biggest wish fulfillment dark roar possible. So leaving Gaster in charge wouldn't be your characters are tortured, but instead your characters live in an endless but fake paradise. Uh, back, back to the thing. Also, what does this mean about the game's larger themes? Escapism? Fiction versus reality? Okay, switching sides one more time. One could make the argument Gaster represents someone who lost themselves to fiction, literally falling into a fictional world. Okay, last time I do that, sorry. Regardless of quality, there are so many tiny pieces of support that have to be perfect, that hold this theory up. There is an incredibly high chance that something happens that causes the entire theory to crumble. That being said, I do kind of have to correct something. I say that tiny support pieces coming undone ruins the entire theory, but in reality, that's not true. If I'm being honest, I think even the biggest theories that are really unlikely are probably going to have some truth to them. In the case of this Gaster theory, so many things can be proven wrong, but through plot devices and complex narrative stuff, the end result could still be Gaster manipulated us into saving him from the depths. Even if the current evidence isn't entirely correct, the end result could still be the same. The fandom's desire for fitting every single fact together like a puzzle piece leads to large-scale theories like Chris Knight getting debunked, and I put debunked in quotations there, and theories like Chris killed Asriel, who's actually Ralsei, getting built up to be things that lots of people believe, when in reality the only evidence is those puzzle pieces fitting together. Lancer says he's the teardrop-shaped kid from the legend. Does that mean the legend is a physical thing? We just saw it because it's a video game cutscene, but does that mean that Lancer saw it as well? Does that mean Ralsei Astral projected the image of the prophecy to us and has previously projected it to Lancer? No. No, it does not. It's a funny line. Same with characters pointing out what buttons to use. Sure, it definitely seems suspicious when Ralsei does it, but so does Lancer and a few other NPCs. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to have a logical in-universe explanation for everything. A lot of parts of larger fan bases that upset me insist on everything making sense, on refusing to accept that movies do things for reasons beyond building a world. Isn't it odd that Obi-Wan doesn't remember owning a droid in A New Hope? Isn't it odd that Luke Skywalker physically throws a rock at the Rancor even though he has the Force? 
No, no, it's not odd. We don't need to piece everything together. We don't need to have a logical explanation for everything. In Cinderella, the fairy godmother tells her that at midnight, everything will go back to normal, including her glass slippers. But the one she leaves behind doesn't turn back to normal. What are we supposed to believe? That it's just some kind of magic slipper? I know at this point I'm rambling. Let me summarize. None of that nonsense matters. Not everything needs an explanation. Things can happen in fiction that break the rules of the universe they're in, but be completely fine because their point is to convey meaning or information. Every single line of dialogue in Deltarune isn't supposed to add up. If it turns out that, yeah, this is Asriel's first time back and he's completely fine, people are going to say, but wait a minute, what about that summer vacation line? Did Asriel miss summer vacation? And I'm really worried that years after Deltarune comes out, people are still going to be making theories about all the kind of tiny, unimportant lines of dialogue that don't actually mean anything. By doing that, by combining the puzzle pieces and connecting every fact we could possibly know, you end up with large-scale theories like Angel's Health with lots of unimportant game logic that the fanbase insists are explicit lore, so it's impossible to debunk. So, to recap about this whole puzzle piece thing, since I'm kind of rambling a bit, A. I don't think we can make theories that go through the entire game from beginning to end and assume everything, since, again, like I said, we only have half the puzzle pieces. Putting all them all together and pretending like this is a full puzzle is, you know, objectively incorrect, since we're missing so much of the game. B. Assuming that everything in the game even has to be a puzzle piece in the first place is also kind of wrong, I think. Things like why did rules turn to stone later than Lancer doesn't need to be something. It could just be for stylistic purposes. And when we're trying to, again, build out this puzzle, filling it in with all these pieces that aren't even supposed to be there in the first place just leads to more and more confusion. So, that being said, C. While I really do think that Gaster might be in the depths, might be in the Angel's Heaven as he calls it, and our goal might be to free him, I highly doubt this theory is entirely correct. Connections to the weird route, how Des is supposed to help us jump files, that's all nice and stuff, but that's missing so much of the game. I don't think Angel's Hell will happen, especially the second half of it. I think while it makes logical sense, it implies that what we know now about the Roaring, about Angel's Heaven, etc., will all stay the exact same until Chapter 7. Or, or it's right. Maybe these facts fit together because they were intended to fit together. Maybe Asriel is dead. Maybe all this stuff is true. Maybe Ralsei is astral projecting things to our vision. Maybe you'll play Chapter 7, go banish the Angel's Heaven, and be met with the man who speaks in hands, who has tricked you into getting to this point. Only time will tell. Okay, that was a giant video, huh? Well, if you're watching still, I need to thank you. Sticking with me through this giant video is honestly very kind of you. To speak candidly for a second, I don't want this video to end on a sour note like, haha, I got you, this whole theory was stupid. That's not what I'm going for at all. This video was kind of just, hey, here's this really complex theory that could solve Deltarune, however, here's the problems with these kinds of theories that solve Deltarune, that have so much evidence that all lines up like puzzle pieces, and here's why this theory may not actually happen, even though there isn't explicit evidence debunking it. To be honest with you, that first part, the Gaster is going to be saved from the Deaths part, is really interesting and cool. You never know, it could happen. Just saying, if you're playing Deltarune and your file gets locked by Gaster, and you're playing through the weird route looking to fight back against him, just remember I totally called it. Another thing, I know that a lot of people who make the kinds of theories I'm talking about, who make the kinds of large pieces of evidence fitting together theories, are going to see this. I'm not like your enemy or anything. I don't, I don't hate you, I don't have any ill will towards you. I think it's great. Because guess what? It's been years since another Deltarune chapter's come out. And like, people that make these large-scale crazy theories, it's totally fun, it's totally awesome. I love seeing people's thoughts, I love seeing people's ideas, even if they're built on ridiculous, crazy amounts of evidence. It's cool! Right? I don't actually have anything against you. I'm not saying don't make theories that do this or this. That's a stupid way of, of being a fan. I enjoy all theories. I love the Asriel is dead theory. Do I personally believe it? No, but it's always an interesting point of discussion. It gets me to think critically a lot about a lot of the parts of the game. It's interesting to talk about. Same with all those theories. I, I do get kind of upset when things like Chris Knight is just shut down by everyone when trying to talk about it because of evidence that I don't think is really evidence, but whatever. In all seriousness, thank you for watching. And now for the final part of this epic saga.